Last question. Is it? Yeah. Oh, sick. What is a training belief or recommendation that you recently changed and what changed your mind? Oof, like so many things, I feel like. I feel like the last year of like having to articulate this stuff better and more clearly and really sort of bring all my thoughts about programming into like one collated presentation has made me kind of analyze like, well, why do I think this? And is this based in evidence? And if not, like, what does the opposite of, you know, the opposite position look like? Uh, so things that I maybe used to think that are no, that particularly recently that I, I no longer believe, um, I probably am even more confident now than training, that training further away from failure has substantial benefits for not only strength, but also hypertrophy, kind of moved away from this effective rep sort of model. Uh, so the effective reps thing were like, the closer you got to failure, the more effective those reps became because you had greater and greater motor unit recruitment, which I don't necessarily believe to be true. Um, I think now, as long as you get somewhere close to failure, you know, within four or five reps of failure, you're probably getting all the benefits there. And that for strength development, anything over 70%, Rep is a rep. Yes, there's specialized skills you can generate by doing heavier singles or heavier multi-rep sets, but that's I wouldn't have you know agreed with that necessarily a year or two years ago. Um, that's one big thing, uh, and, and it's why I explain like what are these ten thousand foot view like uh, programming principles. It's like well, you need to train all the major muscle groups through a re relatively large range of motion, and the intensity has to be kind of uncomfortable multiple times per week. It's rather than like, you gotta go to failure, you gotta do heavy sets of five, or you gotta do squats, bench, and deadlift. It's like just more inclusive, uh, and intentionally more vague. So I probably wouldn't have agreed with that even further. You know, five years ago, you know, oh boy, I'd hate to go back and like listen to anything I said five years ago. Yeah, I mean, we're stupid, it's fine. Yeah, just progressively less stupid, but then as time marches on, we'll get the same amount of stupid. Yeah. So it's like keeping it the same. Um, let's see, other recommendation. I mean, I think we were both probably more specialized, you know, four or five years ago than we are now. Probably in the last year, more more similar, just maybe more vocal about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the progressive loading thing, the way we understand that now and explain it, I think resonates much, much more. So rather than forcing the adaptation and increasing stuff uh, in order to drive the adaptation, rather it's let the adaptation occur and then you can increase stuff to make it the same level of hardness. I think that's kind of like... It's not revolutionary, certainly to other people who've been in this space for a while. They're like, yeah, dude, I've been saying that for years. But the way that I, it's kind of resonated with me and then how I've understood it, that's uh, probably different. Um, I don't know, what else? Anything else you think? Yeah, I, I agree with, I think, two of those that I would echo on, on my end. One would be training further from failure most of the time, uh, I think that. I frequently will still do top sets in the range of, you know, seven, eight, sometimes I'll venture into nine RPE land uh, for like anywhere from one to three reps, but more of my back off work is both lighter and further from failure than it used to be. Uh, so that's kind of one change that, that I've made. And I mentioned a few others in my post about my own training this week. I've been using a bit more uh, variation and um, accessory work than I have in the past. And I think in the past it was something of a, uh, necessity like I didn't have very much time to be doing much you know training or accessory work or stuff like that while I was uh, in residency training I was working just insane uh, hours and really just only had patience and time for like my main lifts and, and kind of moving on now obviously I'm a different stage and um, kind of have some of the time to be able to afford to do that so I think that um, I have found that um, my tendons and things like that are somewhat happier. Although, is that due to doing more of this less specific accessory work or is it because I'm not in residency anymore? Uh, I could make a reasonably compelling argument probably for, for both of those things. You would, you would probably, go in, looking back now, you would say I should have just done less of the very specific stuff and more of the yeah. isolation stuff. Yeah, so if I, could do, if I could do a substantial part of my training career again, I would probably stay further from failure more of the time. I would still expose myself to that super high intensity stuff intermittently. Mm -hmm. Uh, but less frequent exposure to RPE9 efforts, um, and then more of the back off work would be staying further away from failure, not grinding, recognizing this, this idea um, that he was just mentioning where rather than I need to add weight to force the adaptation for the next session, rather if the stimulus during this session is sufficient, then by next session I will be able to increase load without things getting markedly harder. That would be evidence of adaptation happening in that interim. 
right? Um, so it's a very different way of looking at this kind of dynamic. Um, so those are probably a couple of the a couple of the big things that um, I would say I've been viewing a little bit differently and, and, and experimenting with myself and with some of my trainees. Dude, and how short is your like thing to dim? To turn my screen off? Yeah, it's like know. 25 seconds. That is not acceptable. This is what I deal with. So my recommendation would be to increase the duration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the, and then the other thing, uh, I mean, probably have to do, like if you look back over our recommendation, not recommendation history, like we have this thing published, but if you've been following us for any duration of time, you know, things that we recommended in 2016 are much different than things we recommended in 2019, which are now tweaked a little bit more into 2021, and by the time it's 2031, a lot of the stuff's gonna be different, and but further fleshed out, and I just feel like we keep getting uh, not only closer to the truth, but also, I guess, uh, better at explaining why, how we got here. So we've made more errors, that's the thing, right? I'm not necessarily, the embarrassed comment was like tongue in cheek, I'm not necessarily embarrassed about where we started, but I'm more proud of like where we've grown into, right? And so again, 10 years from now, our explanations for things are not only gonna be better and more like fully fleshed out, uh, but also I think we're just gonna be even closer to whatever the truth is as far as we understand how we interact with the world at this point. Or not. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Anything else? No, we did it. Very cool. All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming out to San Antonio, our first seminar back. Give yourself a round of applause. It's been a great weekend.